B. Got it. All right. So we're up on the live stream, y'all. I'm just going to share the link and we will get started. I might watch the live stream from my TV again because I have to multitask. Got it. Let me, what am I doing? Boom. We'll be starting very shortly, folks. Just give me a moment and we will get with the regular programming. Oh. Put it on. Disturb. No. I actually don't know how to do not disturb on laptops. Oh, there's Eva. Eva also sent me the TikTok video. So you know what? Eva doesn't get my call out. Y'all are on top of it. I appreciate you. I think Sylvia has me, but I think that I forgot to text Sylvia back. Because she oh. asked me three facts yesterday. I think I'm the one who's slowing the process because I think she texted me yesterday and I forgot to respond back to it. So are we going to be problem solvers about that? Are we going to? I'm, I'm going to attempt to do it now. Let Thank see. you. So I would like to put this TikTok out like a uh, Friday. Oh, yeah. I, I did not respond back. And then I texted her today on something that had nothing to do with what we were previously talking about. <laughs> so you're just like, you know what? I just feel like I ignored her. I'm going to reply back to what she You left saying. her on red. That's what happened. Rita, I, um, left, I leave people on red accidentally all the time. Yeah, you do. I said, yeah, I'm harping in the back. Yeah, you do. That was my dad. <laughs> I, like, sometimes I like leave people on red because I like start texting and then I get distracted. And then the text is just in the chat field and I never send it. I remember so one time I texted you and I was like, Are you okay? I'm worried about you. You just left me on red. And I was like, Oh. Because okay. I like was gonna respond back okay. and then I got distracted. I do that all the time. I'm gonna respond and then I'm like, I'll do it later, and then I forget for a week. And then they'll like texting was... somebody and then they'll like start typing and then they'll do something else. And I'll be like sitting there waiting for them to respond, them typing for like an hour. I'm just like, what is going on? Yeah, and I'm they just stop typing. I'm like, what? Do you guys really want to know bad. what I was doing before I joined this meeting? I want you to know yes. before you say what you were about to do that not only are we going to hear this, but everyone who watches this live stream it's is not, also It's gonna... just me doing my summer math work. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Go I ahead. Have started my summer homework. I have not started I was doing... Either. Alex, are you taking Algebra 1? I'm taking um math. I out. hate Roland Park kids. I hate you. <laughs> Wait, what are you taking? Are you going to say that with your chest on the live stream? Yes. Oh, okay. No, but if, you live in Roland Park, if, if you're on this live stream and you live in Baltimore, Maryland, and you go or you went to Roland Park, this is a call out to you. Because oh, wow. people like Actually, me no, who went to a school that wasn't like Roland Park, and now I have to take I'm Algebra 1 in sophomore year. Fun fact, I took Algebra 1 in eighth grade. I'm just retaking it again sophomore year because I don't like math. <laughs> okay, but that means that like, you don't have to take calculus in your junior year. You guys want to know what my school did? What? Okay. My school in eighth grade gave us half a year of geometry one and half a year of algebra one. Because they the thought The education that system in America is amazing. And that's what I'm going to say right there. Quote Why? me. Where, the where education system in the United States of America is exemplary amazing, should be modeled internationally. We are doing things 100% correctly. And on that note, that y'all, we are going to get camera? started. Hey, hey, okay. We love the hashtag ban the truth. Um, so with that being said, we are oh, going- Oh, Jasmine, Jasmine, look at what shirt I'm wearing. Period. And new Period. nails, fresh Period. new white oh, yeah, I got the redone. Yes. No. Yes. Wait, Eva, I'm going to pin you really quickly okay. just so that people okay. can see. Wait a second. Aesthetic. Wait um, a second. Aesthetic. What? Aesthetic vibes with aesthetic. the boutique t-shirt. 
period what should i do period period it's just it's period it's a vibe it's all not. right not the i i don't i can't i can't match it's tragic oh wow not the asmr okay live stream y'all should be ready for this lecture if y'all can see we've got the vibes so now it's time to introduce this and get started so let me pin Anna, and then I'm also going to make you the host that you can start getting that stuff set up uh, while I do the talking. I think my video is pinned too. Um, I think so. Hopefully I did that right. Let me just, let me just double check. Make sure it's pinned. Green, y'all. Anna, can you pin me just in case? Can you see if I'm not pinned? And if I'm not, could you add the pin? I didn't think about that. Just pinned you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to yet again, another um, workshop lecture presented by Debate Boutique. We love being able to host these, um, not only for our students, but for all students, um, part of the debate community. We think that it should be normalized, that information and these resources are shared, um, regardless of uh, what institution that you attend, because whatever students' reasons are for not being able to attend, be, they, be them financial or time circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, this information is valuable to all students to prepare them for their debate season, but also because knowledge is super important because the things that we talk about in debate are important, right? Um, so let's try to normalize this practice. The second of four things that I'm going to say is that if you have not already, and I'm starting this one earlier than I usually do at the bottom. So if you've been watching the live streams, you already know what I'm about to say. If you've been watching these live streams, if you've been enjoying the debate with content, what are you doing? If you have not subscribed to the YouTube video, we're almost at 200 subscribers, which is really awesome because it means that we have grown a hundred folks uh, with us in the past three weeks. So that's super exciting. We want to keep on growing our community because we have so much content that's like this and different and beyond um, that's coming up in the fall. So we don't want you to miss out on that. The third thing is going to be that 8 15 21 new fall services will be launched and announced both on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all the platforms of social media. I, I sound very confused. I'm not. Um, I just remember all the platforms that exist. We're going to be launching a whole bunch of services, be it private coaching to curriculum design, be it to all the other things that I cannot disclose yet because I am writing them down. So last, but certainly not least, is introducing this wonderful lecture um, by Anna Bittner. Super excited for it, the politics and controversies of water protection. So if you are somebody who is like, all right, thank you for, you know, telling me about the death of God, Deleuze and Baudrillard, but like, where is my politics to set links? How do I understand, you know, the process counter plans and all of that great stuff? This is the workshop lecture for you. Um, so I hope that y'all enjoy. Anna is an amazing um, scholar, instructor, and mentor towards not only our students, but all students that she has worked with in the past, present, and future. And so I'm super excited uh, for her to be presenting this. And without further ado, I've spoken enough. Enjoy. Hello. Um, so my name is Anna Bittner. I am a rising junior at Wake Forest University. If you can hear a little background music, sorry about that. I am currently in a cafe because my neighborhood had a blackout. So probably another reason why infrastructure policy is good. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but either way, let's get started. Well, talking about the politics and controversies of water protection in the United States. So why should you care about the history of water protection in the United States? There are some applications to debate. You can write really good affirmatives, be it critical or policy-based, and write great case nets. So app-wise, you need a topic link. You can figure out plans and solvency. You can figure out your advantages. You also can know good case nets, right? So if you know the history of why water policy has always been circumvented, you probably have a really great block extension against most core of the topic apps. You can write great politics dis ads. So be it a writer DA that talks about adding on a new water piece of legislation to the affirmative passage through Congress, or be it an agenda policy. Uh, really quick, Alex Rousseau, 
or Rita or Eva, one of you all, can you give me the TLDR of the infrastructure disad 1NC scenario? What does that DA say? Do you all know? Yeah, I do. Um, so basically, they're saying that like fracking is this huge problem in Biden's administration. And so if we pass, like if we reverse the um, amendment to the Safe Water Drinking Act, uh, then that means that the infrastructure bill won't happen because like, um, Republicans will uh, already be so upset about this fracking bill that they won't give votes to the infrastructure bill. Incredible. So the TLDR of that politics DA, so a really normative agenda to add that about political capital, says there is this bill that sh is going to pass Congress or should pass Congress. It's on the brink. You don't want to pick a bill that has 100 percent like probability of passing because then there is no internal link or link trade off. But the argument there is that there's a bill that should pass and the plan, because it's unpopular, kills the political capital that Biden needs to convince the people in Congress to pass the bill. And as a result, a billion bad things happen because we don't get this policy. In specific for infrastructure, a lot of the impacts have to do with technology or also water because that's part of infrastructure and also things like global warming. So that's another really popular politics disad. The last kind of major politics DA, how many of you all have heard of an elections disad or is that before your time? Alex, what is that story like? Um, talk, I don't know, cause I didn't read it because no it was like, right, like I, it happened I, like right before the election. And then gotcha, how about Eva? Did you know, do you know about the elections disad? We had it ran against us like a few times in the beginning of like our first, like our novice year, basically. I think it was talking about just that um, the election was like, was it that it was taking away like some sort of focus on the criminal justice? I forget like what it specifically was last year. You're getting year, there. But... You're kind of close. So the argument yeah. for the elections decide for your presidential or midterms. So think about Senate and all of those two term positions in government would also matter, if not a little bit more, in terms of passing bills on the federal and state and regional levels. That disad story is X person is going to win now. If it's presidential, think of it as this president, like Alex is running for president and they have most of the votes now to beat the other primary candidate Zoe. But since Alex is the current president, if they were to pass a policy on water regulation, it would make them super unpopular with their base and get everyone to vote for Zoe for president. Same thing with like midterms and Senate elections. So it's a little different because you're not looking at one election, but a bunch. So those disads can either be about overall, how many Senate seats are blue versus red, or a specific Senate or House race that is going to happen, that water policy would have a huge implication on. So think about popular versus not popular and whether or not this is something that would help or hurt different political candidates, which is why the history kind of matters, right? So how have people benefited in terms of public policy? What do people in the United States think about water? Third, in terms of the critique, you can have very great, like incredible link work done in the context of history, having really great context to affirmatives. It's about your application of the link to the app, but also you have your analysis of how the history of water policy is predictive of what would happen in the world of the affirmative, but also why it's descriptive of how the federal government functions with relationship to environmental justice, water as a human right, and more. You, you also have some alt examples. So what are some activist groups that have targeted water-based issues you all must know a couple. Can you give me some examples? Um, there's one about line three, suspending line three. I forget what it's called right now. Yeah, the line three protests are huge going on right now. Did you all hear about Standing Rock and the pipeline that was trying to be built? Okay, a little bit before your time. But the TLDRs, there's a lot of different activist examples that have either focused on how we can lead to equitable water distribution and have focused on how you can give communities the best access to the most high quality water, but also people focusing on things like eco-terrorism and how different federal construction projects could massively destroy human health and lands. The last one that's important is in terms of counter plans. So the mechanism you can look at. So how do different policies in the past have, been, have happened? Agents or actors, who are the key people in charge of water? 
and also processes. So what are the ways people pass water policies at the federal or state or regional levels? You also get into questions like what actually is normal means? What are the topic specific arguments we can make? And how do we apply our generics to the topic with some really good example work? In terms of your normal life reasons to care, access of water matters. You need to know where you get your water from. If it's a question of affordability, your community concerns about how you access water, distribution as well. Do private companies hike up your prices? Also a question of water quality. Zoe and I have talked a lot about water purification, for an example, but also is there lead in your pipes? Do you have fresh water? Do you need a water filter? How affordable is that? Do you need to buy a Brita for your house? All these are big questions. Other issue is social justice and activism. If you are an activist or wanting to get more into activism, water is a huge concern. Indigenous groups get their lands and water resources infringed upon, stolen, and destroyed. The example of Flint, Michigan, I'm sure all of you are pretty familiar with. There's line three, like we've talked about. There's all the climate change activists, Standing Rock activists as well. All of these are only but like four examples of some water activists that have happened in the news as of late. Bills also matter. So your daily use, whether or not you live in a state like California, like me, where there's you're prone to droughts or blackouts that stop you from getting hot water like me, or access. So how much money do you pay each month for your, or your parents pay for bills? So water utilities charges are huge and do matter a ton. How do people, how much money do people pay across the country? What is the average? What does that breakdown look like? And lastly, staying informed on politics matters for even if you don't want to become a politician or a lawyer, because it's key to understand how the US interacts with the rest of the world and how state, federal, and local policy changes your ability to get water, which is really just a fundamental kind of right necessary for survival. So here's how the EPA breaks down water topics. It's kind of a quick overview as to how it's managed or broken down in the status quo by the agency most in charge of water in the United States. So it's seen as drinking water, water bodies, wastewater and water treatment, infrastructure finance, pollution prevention and monitoring, and water resilience. Is there anything on this list that you all find surprising? Feel free to just shout it out. Okay. So then how about this list? So this is the water regulatory areas of interest according to the EPA, AKA why I think this topic is huge. So there is a lot on this list. Imagine if an affirmative could pass any one of those policies, let alone a subset of one of these policies. It's pretty, it's a big topic because we can talk about Caicos. A lot of camps have written affirmatives about agriculture runoff into water bodies. There's the issue of biosolids in water. There's drinking water concerns, that's an issue of groundwater, fracking, as you all are aware of, because this is our camp app, and all these other major, major issues in the history of water. These are the modern, more modern day focuses. So you can kind of see water is huge, which is why a top level link to whether or not something is popular or not is not, maybe not the best indicator of what the political climate looks like, because again, Water has a lot of issues going on, and there is a lot of components that make it really complicated. However, it means that when you're affirmative, you can have a lot of fun. You can innovate, you can be creative, figure out what is most interesting to you. See, especially with the criticism, it means you have lots of different ways of applying these theories of power to the affirmative in ways that are both tied to the plan and advantages and assumptions, but also bolster your theory of power and your understanding of how you understand the topic itself. So I have some slides that are mostly detailing the history of water to kind of help provide some background. And then we're going to more just have a more kind of casual conversation about more modern issues. And we'll kind of look at some politics cards as well. So pre-19th century water history of the United States. In, 19, in 1748, the New York water dispute is one of the first major issues of water. So in the British colonies, what would become the United States, a ferry house on the Brooklyn shore of the East River was burnt down. New Yorkers accused Brooklynites, which was a kind of separate area at the time, of setting that fire as revenge for unfair East River water rights. So already we're seeing the rise of access disputes, of development coming in, in terms of like building a ferry house and building water rights as this new way of access, but also as terms of quality and navigation. 
You also see the rise of eco-terrorism. So setting that fire is revenge, right? And we're seeing these local disputes begin really early before we even have the Declaration of Independence. Then in 1777, the British attacked the New York water system. They destroyed the waterworks to weaken military power and turn citizens against the government. This is an, an example of water being used as a tool of warfare, which has been really popular over the history of the world in terms of using water as a way to restrict access, having water wars themselves, or disputes that arise because certain areas are using up all the water from others. This also gets kind of silly in more modern day history where people have the whole dispute between whether or not you should break Northern California Great California into two states, North versus South California, because of the issue of the South being a desert and using all these northern water, uh, nor northern water resources, which is kind of why it relates all through history. But we can see this beginning here before the 19th century even began. Then we get to the 19th century in terms of water policy, where the focus begins to kind of narrow. So the focus of federal policy in the 19th century was encouraging settlement and developing Western, the Western United States. So for all of you Kafka fans or settlerism debaters, this is a good place to start your analysis or begin to understand why water is so innately tied to settlement and development. Water allocation, though, was the key concern amongst all in terms of what the government had say over, what they were really worried about. So they saw water as a critical resource for settlement, and they saw economic activities like mining and agriculture as the biggest ways to benefit the government in terms of private companies and starting to kind of start and different individuals really trying to create these new states and areas as they move westward. So you see this extension of water systems out west from the east coast and seeing how to develop a more continental policy. You also see some federal deference. This is the beginning of states' dominion over water issues and territorial governments as well, making their own decisions with regards to quality and allocation of water. The federal policy, though, was reserved for ensuring, ensuring water flows and economic and domestic uses of water resources. Most of those early federal policies, though, focused on navigating rivers and establishing harbor systems. You, some key legal events that matter in terms of precedents that have been set. So the Givens versus Oakham, the SCOTUS decision, in which Chief Justice John Marshall, from majority opinion, declared federal power to regulate interstate commerce, which carried with it a similar federal authority over navigation. This allowed for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to become a sort of overseer and manager of water, U.S. waterways. And then beginning in 1850, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had their first project. They were asked to develop a plan to control flooding along the lower half of the Mississippi River. They came up with a couple of different plans, but the one that ended up sticking was levees, which if you all have ever heard of Katrina and all of these hurricanes in the past however many years, maybe not a good idea in hindsight, but this is the sort of plan that they first came up with. Then in 1899, we had the River and Harbor Act. This gave the USACE their first direct regulatory mission by authorizing monitoring control and or prohibition of dumping dredge material and debris into navigable waters. So you see the issue of navigation coming up. This is a great Fed key warrant for all of you who are looking to read more of a plan app this year against the state's counter plan because you're tying navigation to commerce in a way that understands these navigable waters are super, super important federal or state right to have as well but only federal government can control it because of interstate disputes, but also with the issues of commerce being directly tied to federal prosperity and budgets and economic concerns as well. You then saw the 1902 Reclamation Act, which created the Reclamation Service, so our kind of the first agency or so. And, but it was renamed in 1923, the Bureau of Reclamation, but they were tasked with developing irrigation and hydropower in the Western US. This grew in size and power to kind of rival the Army Corps during the 40s and 50s. But you see these different agencies and different actors starting to tackle water issues in a wide variety of ways, meaning power and those concerns, but also pollution and what we kind of ID as pollution in the first place. Then we get to activism and advocacy in the, this time as well. So you see this sort of domestic eco-terrorism continuing from the 1700s. But this focus 
was a little bit different. We saw in 1844, a reservoir in Mercer County in Ohio being destroyed by activists that considered to be a health hazard. In 18, the 1850s, there were multiple attacks on New Hampshire dams that impounded waters for factories downstream. And local residents were just really upset about the effects of private increased factory usage and pollution on their own health and water access. Then we also saw multiple repeated attacks on the banks and reservoirs of the Wabash and Erie Canal in Southern Indiana. And in 1887, the dynamiting of a canal reservoir in Paulding County, Ohio by a mob regarding it as a health hazard. There is a whole issue with 1887's incident though, was that the state militia then were called out to restore order. So you see now how these state-based governments are trying to enforce and crack down upon local protesters with all of these state-backed militias and military powers. This kind of creates a new understanding of eco-terrorism in terms of how the state responds to it, but we also see how this is still being used as a tool back from the days of the American Revolution. It's just evolving and you're seeing how local concerns and activists are trying to continue to advocate for themselves against these big companies. We then see the rise of the conser conservation movement and transcendentalism. In 1854, Henry Thoreau's Walden was published, which is one of the first major pieces writing on environmentalism. And we see this new understanding of what it means to protect the earth in terms of its beauty and seeing Mother Earth as this like gen huge, authentic, genuine feminine force that establishes order and regulates how we live and how it determines how we see ourselves in relationship to the earth and its resources. But the problem was with Thoreau and people like John Muir is this whole clash of do we how do you protect our ecosystems for the reasons they've established versus indigenous rights. A lot of these early environmentalists were advocating for protecting the beautiful natural parks, the creation of natural park systems and national parks themselves as protected federal jurisdictional lands. And you, you then see issues in terms of like, what does it mean to protect the beauty, beauty of the lands for federal or settler use versus use by Native Americans and the lands that were originally theirs? Who gets access to water? Whose land is whose? So this is when you get to see these clashes and hypocriticism of these early movements, because while they're promoting protection of resources and stewardship of the land and these kind of missions of protection, they're simultaneously pushing Native Americans off their land, destroying their access to water and land and food and their homes. But you then also see this sort of weird like scapegoating as well onto the Native Americans in terms of why the land has been destroyed. So it's not only their fault, but also these private companies trying to build railroads, trying to increase factory usage of water for hydropower and development and settlerism. And you also see people who are saying these new transcendentalist ideas and scientific management is the best way as a way to indict Native Americans ideologies, worldviews, and practices as not being as authentic or official. So you have a lot of different ways of beginning your topic link. Settlerism is your kind of go-to, but there's this huge history here in terms of why water activists might not have always been the best or most ethical people to begin with. Then we're going into the early 20th century. So in terms of policy, Teddy Roosevelt ushered in a huge progressive era of politics. The New Deal we'll get into in a second, but in terms of the early 20th century, there's this new focus on development and conservation of natural resources. The federal authority expanded through new legislation and the creation or expansion of federal resource agencies. You, under, you see these new goals of developing waterways for multiple uses, for in, including transportation, flood control, irrigation, power, which carrying over from the previous decades, but it's still settlement driven. We see agriculture and economic development intrinsically tied to infrastructure goals. In 1920, the Federal Water Power Act was established and it created a uniform process for the licensing of private hydroelectric, hydroelectric power projects. Though Congress initially neglected to give them funding, but that was resolved in the 1925 River and Harbor Act. That requested the corps and the FPC, federal agency, 
to estimate the costs of appraising the feasibility of hydropower in the United States. That also included improvements in all the other areas I mentioned before, like navigation, flood control, and irrigation. So we see this increased focus on funding, because what happened in the early ninth, in the early 20th century? We have any history box here? So Eva, do you all know? Happened towards the 30s. It was the huge economic depression in the United States, which is what caused the New Deal to be proposed, meaning the New Deal was a way to push a bunch of money into domestic projects, like a lot of huge construction projects and agencies to not only create long-term jobs for people in the United States who are so concerned about having enough resources and funding to live and just survive because we've never seen an economic downturn like that kind of in that recent history, but also because you're seeing how economics is so, so tied to access of water, but also in the terms of like how not having enough money means you can't access water, you don't have enough money to afford long showers, let alone clean water into your house. Then you also have the issue of how water side economics through things like infrastructure bills, where you can increase hydroelectricity, where you can create whole communities that are dependent upon these new jobs. And you're building things like dams, that then had environmental effects that were not so pretty. But in 1927, the USACE, so the same corp engineers, got together and started doing these surveys. They did surveys of land and water resources, and they're looking to increase and promote the most efficient development of water power and control of floods and needs of irrigation. Those became to be called the 308 reports, which listed the basins recommended for more complete studies. Those reports established the first comprehensive river basin development plans for the nation. This is super important because this then was sort of predecessor to a lot of water specific policies after. The activism that happened before the New Deal, kind of, we're going to focus pretty early, but still during the New Deal. So we see a continuation of eco terrorism in 1907 to 1913 in Owens Valley, the Los Angeles. Valley Aqueduct and Pipeline suffered repeated bombings in an effort to prevent diversion of water from Owens Valley to Los Angeles. So throwback to 1700s, where it's New York, now it's LA. Same issues have never really gone away. It's this continuation of who gets water and how it's distributed. You also see people starting to kind of see water and or always like the history of water being understood as something to control, something that we have as a commodity versus a natural right. How you use different tactics to maintain control of your own water and have access to it. Then in 1908 to 1923, there's the Hetch Hetchy controversy. How many of you all who are in the Zoom with me right now, Eva, Rita, or Zoe, have heard of the Hetch Hetchy? I have not. You haven't? Okay. So the Hetch Hetchy Valley is, from, is located in the Yosemite National Park. This dam was first proposed in 1908 with the intention of creating a reservoir that would give San Francisco populations water and electricity. However, a national debate ensued between people who were advocating for conserving and protecting the environment and the most common or most popular example of this was John Muir, who believed that the valley should be preserved for its inherent aesthetic beauty. Note that their main reason for environmental protection was beauty. This is not only a question of nationalism and how we understand value of the United States and our lands, but also what we understand in terms of the utilitarian calculus, which is to say, he believed the valley, he, or sorry, he believed that the valley is important because it's beautiful. But then, conservationists like Gifford Pim Pinchot believed in utilitarianism, where he believed that using natural resources for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time was most important. Meaning, because Hetch Hetchy Valley was protected in the National Park, Congress had the authority to accept or reject any proposal. And this eventually led to the construction of the O'Shaughnessy Dam even though there were multiple letters and petitions filed as well, trying to fight back against this new development. But after John Muir died and the dam was completed in 1923, waters flooded the Hetch Hetchy Valley. 
which destroyed Muir's environment that he so loved and thought was the most beautiful place in the earth. But also that flooding was, has become an enduring issue and there's still a growing movement advocating for draining and restoring that iconic site. So we see the rise of util being used to justify the destruction of the environment in the name of promoting development and prosperity in San Francisco, this pretty young, but very bold new city on, in the West. And you also see the kind of clashes between these different movements that are advocating for how can we help social issues like poverty and resource access for people who are advocating for protecting the environment. But also note, Muir didn't care or didn't really include in his arguments any issues of people who were owning the lands beforehand, what the land was even used for. It was in the question of beauty. So again, we're still understanding how water is valued to the government and what stops or causes bills to be passed. However, and then we see 1935 and 1946, a bunch of new environmental societies coming onto the scene, be it the Wilderness Society, National Wildlife Federation, or the Ecologist Union. These brought together hunters and fishermen and scientists to not only acquire ecologically important reserves, but also to try to fight and preserve wilderness. They want to see actual water systems being used naturally without human control over the land, which gets into the question of eco-managerialism. I'm sure some of you have heard that phrase before. That's going to be a really popular link on this topic because of the historic controversy of whether or not people have access or the ability to control or kind of command how the environment functions and do things like enact engineering projects like dams to control it to our own needs more, but also to kind of change how nature is intended to work, how that disrupts ecosystems, how it leads to worse privatization and more. So we see this historic legacy of this kind of train of thought coming from what was the transcendentalists and beauty people to issues of environmental effects and human health effects and indigenous rights based claims to the land as well. The New Deal, as I mentioned, was important because it was an attempt made by the Roosevelt administration to recover from the economic depression of the 30s. What happened, or the stock market crash in 1929 and 30s depression, but the New Deal was compromise of funding domestic projects to make up for that economic failure and massive job loss and just widespread poverty. So government, the federal government believed that they could be activists in a way that would promote economic prosperity, create new long-term jobs, and create huge construction projects to massively improve the United States development and infrastructure so as to not only uphold that legacy of settler colonialism that we saw earlier, but also to modernize it, to bring it into a new era where we really have an economic interest to do so. So, this is a massive departure from perceptions of the role of government held by presidents before Roosevelt and counter to prevailing traditions of like state dominion over water and regional actors having their control as well. However, because of this departure, we saw a lot of fights about what was kind of justified. Is a nap like in increasing federal jurisdiction justified because it helps nationwide poverty and economics, or is it infringing on states' rights? What matters more? Ultimately, though, Roosevelt was really successful in providing a boost to industry and local economies through inexpensive electric power via hydropower and massive electric projects and construction projects that kind of focus on building dams. This is the huge rise of dams across the United States, and he really believed that the new era of the United States that he wanted to develop was one characterized by individual ownership of electric homes in a developed rural economy. And that's why multi-purpose dams were starting to produce hydroelectric power, provide irrigation for farmers, create flood controls for downstream and promote recreation around the shores of reservoirs, meeting multiple concerns of the public. This would also, they also constructed canals, tunnels, reservoirs, power plants, pumping stations, transmission lines, electrical substations, and new towns, which is a lot, but pipelines as well. 
So you can imagine that we this also has to do with indigenous rights in terms of what water is being dammed and where, whether or not the rivers are able to flood as they used to be. How are we building different hydroelectric plants? What are the emissions? All of these are huge concerns. But these projects ultimately ended up being really popular historically. And even nowadays, people still think of Roosevelt as a good president if you are more inclined to believe in such histories because he was so able, he was so successful in passing a lot of these policies and massively kind of increasing economic output and prosperity because of this relationship between development, economics, and water. We also saw some policies that were important, like the Tennessee Valley Act, the TVA, which is kind of funny for debaters. This is passed in, 1920, in 1933. It was the hallmark of New Deal resource planning. Roosevelt, before his inauguration, promised the Tennessee River region that this act would serve as an example of planning for generations to come. It would tie in industry, ag, forestry, flood prevention, and a unified plan over a, th over a thousand miles that can afford better opportunities and places for people yet to be born and those who still exist now. So we still see this util calculus continuing through policies. But what was so important about the Tennessee Valley Act was that it really did unite all of those core issues into one. So we see how the core controversies of water changed over time, but they're still kind of staying true to their core issues, which is settlement, economics, prosperity, and jobs. The issue though, is that, or what was interesting about the Tennessee Valley Act was that it kind of marked an era of huge confidence in the potential for creating local or regional authorities over valleys and promoting water and related land development with the end goals of social and economic improvement. That led to more than two dozen bills being introduced for Valley authorities across the United States. More policies that were interesting is that we saw some executive level interest in resource planning being reflected in the series of national boards and commissions. We saw all of these new groups like the National Planning Board, National Resources Board, National Power Policy Committee, and National Resources Planning Board throughout this era, where they're trying to understand how to connect federal funding to these national construction projects to improve economics. We then saw in 1936, the Flood Control Act. Section one of this act specified circumstances for federal involvement in improvements for flood control. This act also elevated the corpse flood control activities to the same level as navigation enhancement programs. So we're seeing this continuation of the U.S. Army Corps engineers water protection and control as an agent that isn't responsible for promoting water, but being given more power in this era. And we're also seeing federal funding as a really important issue for water which is a huge solvency deficit to the state's counter plan for all of you who are interested in that as a negative argument as well. We, but we also are kind of starting to see this division of federalism being renegotiated. So what was always the state's issue, except for like navigation and settlement, is now starting to kind of get a little blurry. We're seeing the federal government being more interested in flood control and ways to promote local empowerment of communities and different practices that help the long-term economic prosperity of the region. The same thing with the Federal Interagency River Basin Committee. This was a new advisory coordinating body for interagency water use projects. And it's an understanding of that it was eventually passed by Eisenhower in 1954, but this began in the 40s, or it was abolished by Eisenhower in 54, but it did begin in the 40s as an attempt to expand federal control to agencies like the Departments of Commerce, Labor, Health, Education, and Welfare, which, as I mentioned before, all matter for all your counterplans on the topic to kind of assess what normal means means. Some takes on water policy from the 50s and 60s that matter for you all. The primary concern is that water quality is now going down, which makes sense because previous to this, we saw all these new construction projects that were ended up having really detrimental effects on human health, water health, ecosystem health, and just access to water itself. That's why we see this rise of environmental legislation. All of these different bills started happening because people are now concerned about the health of our environment, not just the health of economics, 
and our ability to develop the land and ag and housing and more. So we, this is again shift from navigation to irrigation and power to environment concerns. So we then see this new kind of expansion of federal authority and jurisdiction. So previously the states controlled most environmental policies like we've kind of been talking about, but now there are these new cooperative or coercive arrangements between federal and federal and state governments. Under these policies, which included the Clean Water Act, which we'll get to in a second, and the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is another huge policy, the federal level set standards while states were largely in control of establishing plans and policies for meeting those standards. Those policies were viewed as kind of a mechanism for subverting what had traditionally been states' sole rights. And it's also a mechanism for expanding federal control and jurisdiction over water. Those new laws place burdens on state and local governments and threaten total loss of state regulatory power if they fail to meet federal standards. So we see this kind of in the federalism DA that I assume to be really popular on this topic. In fact, I think there is a pretty specific topic uniqueness and links to be made about environmental federalism, given this huge history of this constant shift of balance of water being regulated by the state and federal government. But you also see how federalism really matters in the arena of politics as well, right? So a federal infringement on this history could be some, a reason why a bill is really unpopular or really popular in terms of PC. Same for elections. The Cook Commission from in 1950 was a series of water resource investigations that began with the Cook, the Cook or Cook Commission. And they produced a huge report and made a bunch of recommendations for federal planning. Then we led to the Green Book, which was a subcommittee uh, in, on the federal, in the federal government that presented a classic economic efficiency model as a standard for analysis known as the Green Book. This report covered basic concepts of benefit cost analysis, principles and procedures for project and program formulation, standards, problems and procedures, and just a bunch of analyses of various project proposals and cost allocations. So we're seeing this new federal role also in terms of investigation and resource planning, central planning being a huge theme and more. Circular A47 was enacted by Truman. It created new standards for water evaluation by federal agencies. So again, special agencies and what you can do to actually work with these different groups. But also we are understanding in 1962, the Senate document where the Interagency Committee on Water Resources was impacted by the planning of processes of federal water agencies. This policy laid out new standards and procedures used in the formulation, evaluation, and review of agency plans. This is hugely important in terms of oversight and expanding that federal role as overseeing how people delegate water resources throughout the United States, which is why the Water Resources Council was so important because it was part of that continuing effort by the JFK and Lyndon Johnson administration to coordinate, coordinate and centralize federal water planning and policy formulation. Then we'll go to the same era of activism, putting it really kind of, these are a bunch of events that happened for you to all look into if you're interested, but I'll give you the TLDR. Silent Spring is a huge book that was published in 1962, which talked about pesticides, particularly DDT, harming birds and other creatures through runoff into waterways. So we are seeing these new impacts of biodiversity come up to the very front of people's concerns and activist concerns, but also policy concerns. You see the 1965 continual feuds over the fate of the Buffalo National River in Arkansas, a potential dam project. This ended up having to actually being really a deadly feud because people were harmed when there were gunshots near a local canoe race that coincided with this historic controversy. So we're seeing the continuational public disputes, eco-terrorist attacks, but also how people in local levels really care about water distribution, because again, it's a human right to some, but for others, a commodity to own and control. We saw the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference, which was an alliance of local residents and national environmental groups that challenged a hydroelectric plant. The Environmental Defense Fund was founded by scientists who began litigation to ban the pesticide DDT. 
Then we saw the Youth International Party and the Chicago Water Supply, which was huge because we see water getting political. There was a threat that by this Youth International Party to spike Lake Michigan with hallucinogenics. So they're trying, right before the Democratic National Convention in 1968, there are no known poisonings, but we're using eco-terrorist threats now on the national stage. So it's not just a question of stopping privatization, but you're sending a signal to politicians in the context of water. Then in 1968, this is a super, the Memphis annotation strike is really important for your history because it was the first time African Americans mobilized a national broad-based group to oppose what they considered environmental injustices. MLK was involved. He investigated an environmental justice incident and advocated for better working conditions and pay for striking Memphis, Tennessee garb garbage workers. So we're seeing sanitation is really important, but also these ties to civil rights and black radicalism in this era. Lastly, in 1969, something that's really important is this oil spill. An oil rig in Santa Barbara blew out and created 100 square miles of oil slick and killed over 10,000 birds. Pollution remains a major issue, but also pollution in Lake Erie became an issue then as well, where there are massive fish kills. And people now begin to realize, especially as the man, as the first man landed on the moon, just how small and precious the earth is. And as a result, people are really concerned about environmental protection and those impacts. The last pieces to kind of know here that happened were the NEPA, NEPA, which created and formalized a federal policy where environmental impacts had to be assessed for proposed government projects. So the environmental assessment or impact assessment process kind of plan, if you are aware. Then we also saw a bunch of other mandates such that like the Clean Water Act that established different standards for water quality and distribution across the United States. However, we see this watershed kind of new take where starting with Reagan, this approach to management and policy became increasingly prevalent where an area was drained into a particular water body, which served as the management unit as much as the water body itself. Water funding became a huge issue. So we see a decline in construction in favor of funding local communities and other projects throughout the United States. And then the Clean Water Act was passed as well, which is obviously important to not only create those national standards, but lead to more federal enforcement and federal state cooperation in key concerns. We also see this new, this re-emphasizing of power, flood control, and supply from way back when, and moving away from those corp the army corps towards more federal and state actors. So that's the kind of background history. So here are some major names for you all to remember: the Safe Drinking Water Act. What do you all know about this policy? Okay, no worries. So the SWA was the primary law, and still is, that regulates drinking water standards, and it sets national standards for all public drinking water sources. The ESA is also important because this is how we get into not only federal jurisdiction, but also impacts like biodiversity. The Federal Power Act is important because this further establishes the licensing of all private hydroelectric facilities under the federal government. So it's a jurisdictional issue, but also matters in the context of CWA and ESA because state water quality and hydroelectric policies are implicated as well. So we're seeing this continuation of federal balance, federalism balances shifting over time, but also the significance of standards and creating uniformity in how we interpret water policy as being effective or not. Treaties matter a bunch. So a lot of international treaties govern certain aspects of water policy, including NAFTA, which places restrictions on some aspects of water commercialization, but also the International Boundary Waters Treaty of 19, 1944, which oversees the usage of water in the Colorado River between the US and Mexico. So we see another Fed key warrant in the context of water resources being about boundary issues and how internationalism really does matter in how water is delegated and relegated throughout the United States. We have talked about Standing Rock and Line 3, so pipelines being built throughout the United States. That has changed in terms of popularity a lot. I'm sure a lot of you know about these issues. I'm happy to talk more about them later in office hours if you want more of a historical dive. But 
the TLDR here is that indigenous activism has been going on for centuries with relation to water, specifically because of this history of settlerism and economics that we've been talking about. So whether or not water is a human right or a right that is more so economic or commodity is up for debate, but also in how water is understood by Native American communities as something bigger than just a human right or for survival. What is an ancestral water? What does it mean for different waters to have cultural value beyond national beauty or nationalisms? We see environmental justice, at least from sit-ins to toxic waste issues to the EPA cooperating with different Black caucuses. These are huge in terms of civil rights because environmental justice is a civil rights issue. Whether or not different communities have water access is massive. We see that in the context of Flint, Michigan, how different policies have been proposed, but also people continue to kind of speak about Flint, Michigan and providing access and better quality, but what policies are actually going to work? How do you get enough people to fight back against the fossil fuel lobbyists? These are also huge issues in the context of politics that sad internal links because that of course would upset people. You have reasons why policies that promote water quality and access would upset all of those people in Congress who care mostly about big oil and fossil fuel emissions folks and private companies controlling water, but then you also have all those politicians who don't. And that's a huge public concern. That's at the level of the internal link on the level of Congress, but you have the level of the context of the public, whether or not the public sees Flint, Michigan as a bigger crisis in terms of actual human health concerns and communities not having water versus their focus on economics, whether or not they think it's more important that those private companies continue to pollute waterways, which is a huge controversy that it's not really going to ever be resolved until the fundamental kind of contradictions of capitalism are kind of explored on the deeper level by activists. So you see this, these continuing trends throughout history. You see environmental and, and the indigenous environmental network, the West Harlem Environmental Action, the Office of Environmental Equity, all of these new attempts made at local and national levels to promote environmental justice and equity, equity in terms of access, quality, water assurance programs. But again, the main kind of theme from this lecture you should take is that there is a huge history of water policy on the national, local, and state realms, also international, that have the same issues happening throughout history, be it federalism concerns, be it how eco-terrorism tactics are used, indigenous rights, what is water to individuals, what who is it popular for, economic developments, and more, that give you a huge legacy of debates on that all of these levels to pull from for your own arguments, but also to base your affirmative strategies in for negative strategies. If you know why the Federal Power Act is so important in terms of federal preemption of state power, you said, probably have a great Fed key warning at the state counterpoint, or a reason why certain policies may actually be enforceable at the federal level because of the state jurisdictional concern from the 1970s. So you can use history in this way to kind of develop your links for both policy and critical debates because it's not just a topic link. The state's counter plan circumvention argument and more. Do you have any questions? This is like a big lecture because water policy is huge, but hopefully this is a good overview in terms of the main kind of political controversies and concerns. So any questions from you all? I don't really have any questions. I think that was really like good and covered a lot. And I definitely know that I can like bring these up in later rounds, especially, or people will probably bring up a lot of these in later rounds as well. So it'll be good to have background on them. So thank you. And yeah, also Rita, Rita just texted me, said they were, are not at their laptop, but to tell you thank you because they're eating dinner. <laughs> of course, no um, I'm so glad this was helpful, but again, Remember that like these examples are going to be used throughout evidence and people's speeches, be it analytics or not, and knowing these references are really helpful. So when you see reasons why the Safe Drinking Water Act created a precedent for this new policy the F wants to pass, that's super important to note. So why is this at that precedent? What precedent are you pulling over? Because again, all these histories intersect in ways that you can critique or propose solutions to and then you can see how similar solutions in the past have failed so as to, you can write an even better affirmative or an even better counterplan strategy against some of these apps that sound a lot like echoes from the past policies 
yeah, that's all I got for you all. This was an awesome webcam. So glad I could help you all more. Yay. Thank you so much, Anna. This was amazing, amazing, amazing. If you want to make me the host, I will end the stream. Yeah, y'all, this was definitely a workshop lecture to watch, a lot of insightful information to help up your politics counterplan all the policy things, games.